It is a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing my buddy who was, uh, I was talking to her. She was in town consulting in another office and, uh, Lacey, I love it. I, I love this podcast the most. The reason is it's so good is because I get great guests like you. And if there's anything I think about a use for a quarter of a century, you're keeping it real. I mean, you're from Aztec, New Mexico. That's not necessarily the Beverly Hills right. or the Key Biscayne or the Manhattan. And I know so many dentists who just said, you're the real deal. You keep it real. You're fun. You're smart. You're down to earth. Um, I want to start this off with a... Uh, um, you're, you're talking to thousands of dentists and they're all multitasking right now. They're driving to work. All right. And it's my belief, here, here's the weird thing about consultants. When I look at all the successful offices like mine or Jerome Smith or whatever, we, we've had consultants come in every couple, two, three, four, five years, and, and we're crushing it. And everybody that I know that's used consultants in the past, all my friends have used consultants in the past, they're all doing between like one and a half and three million a year. Okay. And then you look at these poor bastards who are miserable and stressed and confused and just ready to just start swallowing the Listerine after they swish and they never get consultants. And I don't know if it's because they're just cheap and tight or they don't know what they don't know. So I want you, what I'd like to talk to you today is just, um, Try to paint some pictures. She's driving to work right now. She thinks okay. she thinks this is as good as it gets, and it's just as good as it gets. What 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 do what do they not know that you've seen? Because they only they just live in their own office. All they see is their own office. Right. How many offices have you seen in a quarter of a century? A lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot. A lot. So so what what, what do they don't know? Because you know, done this, they think they know it all. I mean, sure. they got A's in math, physics, chemistry, biology. They know it right. all, but they don't know what they don't know. Gosh, where do I start? I know. Where do I start? I have, um, so this is what I tell my team members all the time to help them understand who they're working for. So dentists go to school to become a dentist. That's what you do, right? You go to school for four to eight years to become a dentist. We don't take business courses. We don't take management courses. We don't take leadership courses. Um, sometimes we don't even know the ADA codes that we're supposed to be using when we graduate from dental school, right? None of them know the codes. Right, which freaks me out. But yeah, none of anyway, them know. No need to know what's going to keep us out of jail, right? But so, <laughs> so we graduate, and I say we, I'm not a doctor. You graduate, and all of a sudden you're expected to buy a business, hire people, manage, and lead them. And you have absolutely no idea how, nor do you want to. You want to do dentistry. That's why you went to school for as long as you did. That's why you made the investment in yourself that you did. So what don't they know? They don't know the business of dentistry. They don't know how to manage people, how to hire good people. You know, I mean, it's crazy to me. Simple statistics really overall production of a practice 35 percent of your overall production should be hygiene i can't believe how many dentists don't actually know that you know they'll ask us do we have the patient base do we have can we add another hygienist and we don't just walk into your office and look do you have another operatory it's about business and i and i think that's the big thing that we're missing I really do. And that's one of the things I've always loved about you and quoted you in my courses is the business of dentistry. And I really feel like dentistry or the business and teams dealing with human being teams, not the patient who gets up, comes in and leaves, but the people you have to spend five days a week with, that's what we're missing. The people skills. Absolutely. And you know, and it's sad because um, if you would have gone to college and had people skills, you would have joined a frat, had a girlfriend, you know, went out a couple nights a week right. and picked up a few C's along the way. <laughs> and you never would have been a dentist or a physician or a lawyer. So it's the total genius freak unicorn geeks like me who sat in the library till midnight every freaking night at Creighton. This is what I heard. This is what I heard every night at about 10 till midnight. Ding. The library will be closing <laughs> in 10 minutes. And we would cuss. Yeah. We would be mad that they're closing the library. So, so the natural selection is all these bookworms and that bookworm comes out of dental school and now is got to be a people person. Right. And if, and if you look at dentist as a whole, the, like we do a lot of the disc personality profiling, as a matter of fact, we do it with every client we bring on board. Um, 
if you look at the dentist as a whole, you guys are a C type personality, which is um, conscientious. You know, you need a ton of information. You like details. Well, I would hope so because you're working in an area that's this small with a million details in here. But that's where you're happy and that's why you guys were in the library that's why you were at school and you weren't out at the fraternity doing the things that you were doing because you need those details and you're an analytical thinker so when we take that into a business environment and still 80 percent of your team members are females are women working in these dental offices all of a sudden you come into this business environment that's also healthcare, and again we don't know what we don't know but we know we don't want to <laughs> manage these people all day long. Oh, yeah. I grew up with five sisters. I mean, Saturday morning, I used to, the first thing I did was went right out the front door, and I wouldn't come in until the mandatory when the street light came Yeah, in. you were born into dentistry yeah. <laughs> simply because you had five sisters. When you have five, and, and who was my friend? It was David Hornbreck, and who was he? He was a Catholic kid of the kid whose mom had the reverse. She had like six kids and one girl, six oh, boys wow. and one girl. Yeah. So I just marched right over there his house. So, and, so, and hung out with his sister? <laughs> no, I probably should have, uh, but, um, so here, so I, I want to do this, this dentistry on sense. I like to get right to the brutal crass. What I, my goal here is I know the elites will hire you. That that's not why I want to talk to you. The, the, they always get help. It's the underly. So I want to get right to the crunch is, uh, what do you charge Okay. and describe the problems that you fix. I, I want this person driving to okay. work and saying, this is your, because every consultant has a unique <clears throat> selling proposition, a core competency. You know, how much do you cost? And by the way, these people wouldn't be in business for 27 years if they didn't have word of mouth referrals, repeat business. This is the tightest industry in the world. Agreed. Then this reminds me of a town of 5,000 where mm -hmm. if you sneeze on one side, they say, God bless you on the other end. Everyone knows everybody's business. And, and these consultants can't survive for two and a half decades because they're not helping people. So what do you cost okay. and, and describe your perfect client? I love your just, oh, let's get to it. So uh, what do we charge? Here's what I'm going to tell you what we don't do. We don't have a big, huge annual contract. We don't ask for a large amount of money up front. All of our contracts are monthly contracts. And um, so you got to earn it month to month. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's damn cool. Um, but, it, you know, I don't. How am I going to talk to you over the phone, maybe meet you in person and say that's going to be $40,000 for the next 12 months when I have absolutely no idea what you really truly need? You know, and the other thing is we go in and we see our clients every quarter and we go in for two and a half days every single quarter. And what we do is we spend the first two days with patients and we are in the trenches. Sometimes I'll assist. You know, and, and we're answering the phones, but we're right by, we're side by side with the team. We're listening to verbal skills. We're looking for missed opportunities, but we're also looking for celebrations. What are you guys doing really well? So the way we've set our company up, everything's a month to month contract. Um, the contract in the month, the monthly fee is completely dependent on the size of your practice and how many team members you have. So it could be anywhere from eight ninety five a month to 3,500 a month, depending on how many team members you have and what needs to be accomplished. We never walk in with a three ring binder and say, here's all your tabs, read our binder, you'll be fine. That's not what we do. As a matter of fact, we kind of have an empty three ring binder. And as we visit you, as we discover your celebrations, as we create your verbal skills specifically for your team that makes them feel comfortable, we start to build that three ring binder so that they have something to refer back to. Does that make sense? Yes. And when, okay. So right now we're in the, the heat of the, um, the NFL playoffs and we're down to four teams right. this Saturday, Sunday, will be down to two, then the Super Bowl. Um, obviously when you leave these four teams, they all have four amazing quarterbacks. When you go into your average office for 25 years, how many, what percent of the time do you look at the staff and say, 
okay, we're never going to go to the Super Bowl with that assistant or that receptionist <laughs> or that hygienist. Oh or is it gosh. usually, or is it usually the dentist? And and uh, yeah, so <sighs> talk, talk, great, talk about talk what about a great it. question because there's two there's two things that you brought up here that I love. First of all, I actually hate the word consultant. I really do because I feel like in dentistry it has such a negative connotation. The team feels like oh they hired a consultant. They're going to come in here. They have no idea what our day is like. They have no idea what our office is like. They're going to fire everybody and they're going to tell us everything has to change. That's not what we're about. I like to call myself a coach because I want to find out what are you doing now? And is there any way that I can help you to become more effective and efficient? Because I have some amazing systems. I have some amazing contacts in the industry. So how can we tweak what you're already doing to make you more effective and efficient? Uh, I, I really, there's never been one time that I've walked into an office and just said, uh, they have to go, they have to go, they have to go, they have to go. There's been one time ever in the history of my coaching that I recommended on the second visit, the office manager had to go. Like, seriously, we needed to bring the police in. But what we found <laughs> is four counts of felony fraud up over $250,000. And we discovered that in the first two visits. So that's honestly the only time I was like, call the police and let's have her arrested because she's a felon at this point. Um, other than that, we're, we're not going to walk in and say they have to go, they have to go. What we will say is you have a rock star here. Let's build on this person. Let's work with this person. Now, maybe this person over here isn't a rock star, but they're loyal and they believe in your vision, so let's work to find the right seat on the bus for them. And, and not everybody's always the right on the right bus. You know, I, the office I was in this week, they said, oh, we're on a bus. It may be a short bus, but we're on a bus. So finding, finding the people is, is awesome, but we have to make sure they're sitting in the right seats too, because some people weren't made to be a chairside assistant, but they're personable and they're friendly. So maybe they should be at the front desk maybe they should be the first person that somebody talks to or that somebody greets and because you know a chairside assistant as you well know they need to kind of pay attention right uh they can't get distracted by squirrels and if you have that <laughs> i personality you want to put that person at the front so that everybody feels comfortable when they walk through the door so i mean that's a little bit of what we do as well you may have a great team but they may not all be in the right place when, when you look at the when you go into an office, you look at the problems. Can you categorize them like um, in, in like a most common to least common? Like, is it is it personnel? Is it a mm. lack of uh, marketing? Is it overhead? Is it is, you know? We, we, we may, or maybe just like they did in MBA school, they just do case studies or you know, like again, I'm 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 trying to I'm trying it would be my um, honor if somebody that really needed help and was stressed out and burned out and um, you know just miserable mm -hmm. god help mm -hmm. and i so i i'm trying to conduct a podcast to where we help them pull the trigger absolutely so so, so talk about what kind of problems you've seen what you like to fix i i, I honestly think about 80 percent of our offices that we go into there's some sort of team problem really hr absolutely people. whether it's, and, and whether the hardest it's the part of football that, Howard, or dental is when it's the doctor do you yeah. know how hard it is for us as coaches? Like you called me, you hired me, you want me to come in and day one, I'm like, mm, it's you. <laughs> That's a really difficult conversation to have, but you have to be able to have. But you're saying that that's the issue 80% of the time. I'm not saying the doctor is the issue. I'm saying people are an issue 80% of the people time. People are the issue 80% of the time. And of that 80%, 1% of the time is it the doc? Mm, I would say a little bit more than that, probably. More than 80%. Oh, yeah. So 80% of the time, it's a people problem. Yes. And of that, the doctor is the problem, what percent? 90? Mm -mm. Let's go 50-50. I'll give it to him. Let's go uh, And she's winking at me. <laughs> if you listen to this on iTunes, she's winking at me. So, so yeah, you know, and I've, I've always thought if, if, if I would have met you uh, when you were 12 and you told me that you were going to have this career, I think I would have sent you to psychology school and say, you know what? You probably ought to be a psychologist before you get into this because, yeah. because it's 99% yeah. of dentist problems are in between their ears. But you know what is funny about you saying that? When I was 12, like when I was in eighth grade, I told my parents, if I could figure out how to get somebody to pay me to talk, my life would be complete. <laughs> so what I do now, And you just I spoke at the Arizona Dental Association. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone loved it. Yeah, 
I mean, I think they do. They, they, I've been back several times. I mean, yeah. I've spoken at the Hinman meeting nine times now. I'm a featured clinician at Hinman. So, I mean, I have my talk show, right? Every time I get to step on stage and they they lavalier me up, I have my talk show. So it's cool. But, but yes, it's very... I said, a, we, you, want, you should speak at the townie meeting sometime. I would love to speak we at the townie meeting. We have that every meeting. year. What is it this year, Ryan? March, March 29th to April 2nd? March 30th to April. March 30th, April 2nd, go to townymeeting.com. Will you speak there for us some Of course I would. I would be honored to speak. And then after the you county. speak, we'll go drink at the bar till three in the morning. That would be even, that would be an <laughs> even bigger honor. <laughs> and that'd be the bigger audience. Every, every time. No kidding. The, I mean, every town meeting, there's, there's, by the time it's two in the morning, there's at least 300 dentists we in could, the bar. It's we so could funny. ask for a couple of spoons from the kitchen and we could like play like we're having a podcast in Vegas. That would be kind of fun. So I believe, <laughs> I believe that the reason dentists, physicians, and lawyers are what they are is because, again, it's the dental school deans who mm-hmm. wouldn't accept anybody that was well-rounded and had C's, B's, and A's. So it's too late for that. You've got all these guys that got A's in math and calculus and physics, and you're talking to them right now. Right. So tell them, tell them how, <clears throat> what, I, what I like to do is reframe it. You know, so you see something one way. How do, how, how do they need to rethink? Well, I think... I. Th- I think you need to rethink that you can't do it all. They can't delegate. And, and you can't, you can't do it all. And, and it's funny because there's those dentists who put their entire trust into the entire team. And those are the poor guys, gals that get taken advantage of. And then you have those dentists who think they can do everything and they micromanage, you know, they're, they're checking the schedule They're Did you call this patient? Let's move this patient. How's hygiene doing over here? You have to hire great people. You have to have phenomenal systems in place. And it took me a while to describe systems to some of the team because when I say system, they think automatically software. But what I'm talking about in a system, just for an example, a system, if you have an hour hygiene appointment and 45 minutes of that hour is literally with your hygienist producing and a patient shows up 15 minutes late, Okay, it's going to take us another five minutes to get them to the back. I'm at the point now where my hygienist gets 20 minutes with that patient. Is that is that allowing us to really, truly provide quality care to not only the patient that needs to be in the chair, but to all the rest of the patients the rest of that day? And what does that do to our entire team? It causes chaos. So we're not providing quality care. So what we need is a system that says, if a patient is running late, this far into an appointment, these are the skills that I'm gonna give my business team to have that conversation with a patient where they don't feel pissed off because we just told them they can't be seen, but they understand it's for their benefit. It's because we can't provide you the quality of care that we are destined to provide you this far into the appointment. So I'm going to need to reschedule you. That's a system. I mean, and, and it sounds pretty basic, but you would be amazed at how many front office um, gals, guys, don't have the ability to do that. So a patient walks through the door and they're like, oh, we'll go ahead and see him. We throw him into the chair. That throws us off schedule. Doctor can't come in for the, ex- I mean, it just, it throws everything off. So for me, that's a system. We have to have phenomenal systems set up in order to create that success. But look look at the market failure. I mean, it's eight years to be a dentist. It's four years to be a hygienist. Um, These assistants are paying 18 grand and going for a year to get their CDA. The girls up front, they they used to work at Chase Bank. That's right. And Monday, they're in a dental office. I mean, our our own profession does it to ourselves. Isn't that awesome how we do that? We hire people and don't train them at all. Well, I think I think the profession's at fault. Um, oh, I'm, I'm totally I mean, why, being why sarcastic. Does, why, why does it makes the, me crazy. Why does why aren't the dental schools? There's two dental schools in this town. They don't teach. Right. They don't. They don't have anything for receptionists. I mean, why are you speaking to him and why aren't you speaking to AT still and have a mm, class of uh, I would love fifty that. Uh, people? Uh, you know, for a year. What you know? Why? Why? Well, why and is the other thing I've said all along as well is why? Why are we not? Taking someone like myself, Teresa Duncan, Patty DeGange, somebody who talks about billing and co- like coding, fraudulent, like how to stay out of jail. Why aren't they teaching to call to dental school students? Why aren't we in there your second two, your last two years of your college career teaching you how to keep yourself out of jail? 
I, I don't understand that. And it's just, absolutely one of my uh, one of my local friends uh, went to jail. Mm -hmm. you, you know what that guy? And he's I mean so silly. He thought he was doing the patient a favor, so they need a crown, right? And the mm -hmm. insurance pay half, so he knew they didn't have money, so he'd bill for two crowns, and so the oh. insurance so they pay for two halves, but he'd just do one. Well, the insurance companies have algorithms, and they say, okay, ninety six percent of all crowns are billed one at a time. And in your office, 98% are billed two at a time. So they sent a human in there, audit the charts. That's brutal. And the insurance claims that went up the street right here in Arizona, that's misdemeanor, stuff like that. But the insurance claims that crossed the state line, that's what they got Al Capone on. That's, that's mail fraud. So, so we, and they sentenced them for five years. Well, the other problem is when you, if you're seeing any <clears throat> portion of Medicaid in your office, that's government, that's federal. You're going to get in way more trouble if you see Medicaid in your office as well. Well, you, th that's a good sequence. I, I, I want to ask this. This is the question I see all the time on, on Dental Town. Okay. They, they'll sit there and say, okay, um, um, they'll say, I don't understand my fee schedule. It doesn't make sense to me because 90% mm -hmm. of my patients are on 10 PPOs. Okay. And my, my fee for a crown is 1200 but 90% of my patients on 10 PPOs, kick it down to 900. Mm -hmm. So my fee is 1200 for 10% of my practice. It's kicked down to 900 for 90% of my practice. Um, you know, w w what up with that? And, and how is your cash portion gonna grow if you, they call the phone, how much is a crown? 1200. Right. And then they're like, 1200? And my friend Susie at work, she just got a crown. Her dentist, it was 900. Right. And the dentist has said my fee is twelve hundred. Ninety percent of his patients pay nine hundred. And let me tell you so, a, big, a, so, a so, big problem with yeah, this, so, the so, business so side of that. PPOs. The business side of that. Here's what ninety nine percent of offices in America do. They have a standard fee, right? That you have it in your software, but they only charge what the insurance will pay. So, for example, they put in their standard fee schedule, and then they put in these PPO fee schedules. Well, that's all they send to the insurance company. Howard, I know you know business. How, how, how is that business-wise at all? We should always be charging our fee Wait, like when the insurance pays, then you do your write-offs. So I'm going to charge $1,200 every single time. On the claim form, it's $1,200. When insurance comes back and says, we'll pay 50% of $900, then I know I'm writing off $300. Then at the end of the year or at the quarter, I'm running a report. How much is um, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona making me write off. So how much money am I actually losing? If you only charge what the insurance company is going to pay, how do you ever know what business you're actually doing? But at, but at what at what percent um, is the PPOs killing your oh, your fee? It's brutal. It is, br it and, is and, brutal. And, and, and let me ask this though, because I don't want to give away your age. You're you're not nearly as old as me, darling. Uh, that's might not be uh, so obvious on iTunes, but on YouTube that it's obvious. But you've been in it a quarter of a century, right? I've been in the dental industry 26 years this year. Yeah. I started actually coaching and speaking in 2004. Okay. Is it better or worse than it was 26 years ago? Oh, the, the, I mean, wow. specifically the, the PPO insurance you overhead know what? I think problem. It's I think it's worse because I moved to Phoenix in 97. I went to work for a practice at 7th Street and Bethany Home Road. Was I, I moved here and four days later I had a, a, a job at that office. And within six months, we were a fee-for-service practice. Like we had cut out insurance. And then uh, one of my- Now when you say cut out insurance, you mean cut out PPOs? We would we would um, we would file the insurance for the patient as a courtesy, but the patient paid up front the entire amount up front, and they were reimbursed by the insurance company. Now, do you see those practices anymore? Twenty seven years later, barely. These people that say they're going to drop all insurance and it's, do it's just so cash. It's so hard. It, the problem is everybody thinks they get so many patients from insurance. Well, I can't I can't uh, drop that insurance because they give me so many patients. Okay, really? Do they? I, and this is part of my job that I love too. I love the analysis of it. Okay, let's go run a report. Really, truly, how many patients do you have that have this insurance? How much do they make you write off? So how much per patient, how much per service are you providing that you're actually making any money from this insurance company?
And, and the other problem is we as Americans, Howard, we, we think that dental insurance is exactly like medical insurance and it has nothing to do with it. I'm constantly telling my teams to say dental insurance will assist you. Dental insurance doesn't pay. You know, you don't get two free cleanings per year. They're going to assist you with about maybe, if you're lucky, twelve to fifteen hundred dollars per maximum per year, right? But we as Americans think it's just like medical insurance. I have a magic plastic card. I'm going to walk in and hand it to you, which is, you know, sometimes they hand us their medical card, and I'm going to pay you a copay, and I don't ever have to pay again. So part of that's a problem as well. But we come back to the team on that one, right? From that very first phone call, our team should be educating our patients exactly who we are and how we do business. So um, how do you how do you um, build that team? How do you educate that team? How do you how do you get them up to a skill? Well, my first is always desire, and I tell I tell doctors, I tell business owners all the time, I can train skill, I can't train attitude. And I, I, myself personally, I really can't train attitude because I'm a lot like you. I'm not going to put up with that crap. <laughs> but if, if we have somebody who has that desire, who has the want, who is excited about dentistry, who truly believes in what you as a, as a dentist, as a boss is doing, I can train you the skill. I can give you a skill. We... I think we have phenomenal verbal skills, but I'm never going to do the whole here, say this and you'll be fine. You have to take it and make it your own, but we can give you a basis for that. And, and I think one of the things that um, Bonnie and I, I have to say, so I have a business partner, Bonnie Pugh. She lives in Baltimore and, and it's our company, Practice Dynamics. But one of the things. And did you guys, did you guys meet in AA or in jail? <laughs> She bailed me out. It was she jail. Bailed, it, was her, it was her bail money. It was her, totally her bail money. So um, now, now, does she live in uh, New She's Mexico? in Baltimore. Oh, she's in Baltimore. Bonnie mm -hmm. Hughes in Baltimore. Yep. Huh. Okay. Yep. So one of the things that, that we really are striving for, when we go in and we meet the team, we want that passion. We want that desire. We want them to have the desire to not only have personal growth and make themselves a better person, but they really truly believe in what the doctor, in what your vision and your mission is. And, and see, that's another thing we run into is if the doctor has no idea what their passion is, what their vision is, what their mission is, how do I get an entire team to follow you? And a lot of times I, I love dentists, but they're not great leaders coming out of the box. You think? <laughs> Really? <laughs> so that's another Did part you just of my notice this Tuesday. <laughs> that's another part of my Oprah moment is bringing out the leadership. Like, let's bring out that leadership. Let's. I know you're passionate about implants and dentistry, but let's bring that passion to your team. So every single time they have a conversation with a patient, whether it's on the phone, when the patient is checking in for their appointment, whether it's in the chair, we all have that shared passion. We all have the shared education that we're giving the patient because the, if I have eight team members and they're all basically on board and saying the same thing you don't have a problem with patients saying yes after that I want to I want to I, I go back to what you said about the uh, the attitude um, I think the reason we don't put up with the attitude is because there's no evidence that you can really change someone else's attitude I mean it's an inside job and I, I've noticed the three traits that I've seen all the dentists that come out and crush it they have the the right attitude they're humble and mm -hmm. they're intellectually curious. Mm -hmm. And when they meet someone like you, they just they just humble and and, and they 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 feel safe and humble enough to say, "Tell me what I don't know." Right. What, what do you think of my numbers? You know, come come help me. You know, I, and I maybe I have a question for the dentist who who call us. They call us. They ask us questions. We talk to them like this. We tell them how this all works. And I'll just give you a for example. Young Dennis called me. Um, and are you going to give out that number? Can they call it? What, what if someone's listening and does want to call you? I will give you my personal cell phone number. All right. What is it? It is area code 623-810-1352. What if they're emailers? Lacey, L-A-C-I dot Phillips, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S at practice dynamics.net and uh that's funny because you're in new mexico and when i was in scouts that uh somewhere around new mexico mm -hmm. mount, mount phillips wasn't it oh or, is it that's it, ours it, it was uh 
Well, it was the founder of Phillips Petroleum. And oh, then, yeah, that's totally me. And then I totally think they me. sold it to... Do you know that mountain? <laughs> no, I'm kidding but do, you, do, you, do you know somewhere on New Mexico? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Mount uh, Philmont. Philmont Scout Ranch. Oh, I actually have heard of that. Oh, my God. It's the Mercedes-Benz of your <laughs> scouting adventure. And You're we so went there cute. for a week, and we climbed Mount Phillips, and the, um, one was Mount Baldy, and... Uh, I think we did a 56 mile trek in 10 days and you earned a bunch of merit badges. God dang, that was the coolest thing. And that was your father, right? You, <laughs> you inherited an oil company. That is correct. You Howard. never worked a day and, in your life. And I've decided to stay in the dental <laughs> business. <laughs> Just out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> I know I'm helping millions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so young Dennis calls me. I have a great conversation with him. He bought a practice, moved to a brand new town bought a practice, inherited the team. He just knows he's just not clicking with the office manager. It's just, and he's even sat down with her and they've agreed. They're just, they're not right together, but they keep going, they keep going. In the meantime, literally five conversations, emails every day, him and I going back and forth. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? Absolutely, I can help you with this. So he emails me one night and he says, um, had another conversation with the office manager. We've decided this isn't going to work. She's leaving in the next two to three weeks. Um, I have to find somebody, hire them, get them trained, and then I'll call you back and we'll bring you in. <laughs> and, and I go, okay. Because at that point, what do I say? I'm like, we, we've had five conversations and we email each other every day. Why do you not think I can help you with this? How old is he, do you think? He's young. I want to say he's in his late 20s, early 30s. And when do you think a dentist gets their first brain cell in management? Oh, wow. I mean, the best, you, the, the best you've you? seen. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm 53. <laughs> I'm 53. But uh, do, do you see any of them get it in their 20s? No. 30s? Yeah. You know what? One of the best. And again, the, one, the few that do, the first thing you'd walk away saying about that person is, that's a really nice doc. She's really humble. Yeah, she, that's true. She asks I'm sitting really here good thinking questions. about some of the dentists that we've worked with, and that's true. And you know, one of my favorite, favorite all time dentists, I learned so much from him. I was an actually an, a team member. He was in Sun City, Arizona, and I worked for him. He's the one who did all my veneers. He was an LVI guy, and he was my age. So, I mean, he was, what, 30, 34, 35 when I was working for him, and just. I mean, phenomenal. And I was learning from him. And, uh, you know, that's exciting to me. When he wanted to learn something every single day, he took the entire team to LVI. He taught us about, you know, veneers and the ridges and why we want him to look, you know, real. People hate watching movies with me that aren't in dental because I'm like, yeah, there's a crown and a <laughs> they have dentures and they fit horribly, you know, but I, it still excites me after all these years. I, I love the dental aspect of it, but I really like the passion and finding other people's passion and bringing that out and getting the team on board and, you know, singing hey, what, what do you, what do you kumbaya. Of, um, what, what do you think of this piece of advice? Sometimes dentists are all stressed out and they're talking to a buddy and they're like, you know what? Be because I, the reason I get being a dentist, you know, because I am a dentist. Right. I would seriously rather pull four wisdom teeth than, you know, a mani pedi, a massage, sure. a nice meal. I mean, I, I, I love molar endo. I, 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 I get it. And a lot of people who just really just want to do dentistry, they think to themselves, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make my old lady. She's sitting at home with three kids. Oh, she needs to get her butt down here and do this because I'm busy doing the work. Or, right. or you know what? I'm just going to put an ad out for an office manager and let her freaking take it. Right. Talk to that dentist who's thinking that thought. Um, Gosh, why in dentistry do we bring the wives in? Why do we do that? Because truthfully, on that first date when you were making out with her in the back of the car, you were asking her insurance codes. You're asking her the difference between return on asset, return on equity. Because you, you finally know. got her to say yes. You think she could get the patients to say yes. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Oh, I like that one. Okay. I know. What happened on your date that made you think this would be your next office right. manager? Right. Right, and, 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 and you're talking to a lot of husbands now. Oh, I know, and believe not, me, not, I worked for three it's not dentists. The wife. It's the, it's I worked the for three dentists, and their wives were the office manager. And luckily, they were phenomenal, intelligent business women who got it. 
Um, but you know, we also have that, um, there's that stereotype and the team is like, Oh, the doctor's wife. It's, it's almost like you don't get the respect from the get go because it's the doctor's wife. She's in the office now. She's also busy raising a family, keeping a house, doing other things. I believe, I believe in my heart of hearts, you have to have a business minded, if not a business oriented person to be a business administrator. You know, sometimes we call them an office manager. I prefer business administrator because they should be looking at the numbers. They should, they should know our overall production growth, um, you know, production versus collection and then those write-offs. They need to know the business aspect, but also have an incredible um, rapport with the team, but not be afraid to let the team know, you know, we'll crack the whip if we need to. So I think it has to be business-minded when, we, when we're looking at those front office teams. And another thing here is just one of my quirks. I hate front office, back office. I just hate that thing that we do in dentistry that says front office, back office. And I was both, you know, I was a chair side assistant and then I was, I managed several practices. I hate that we draw that line and we say our back office team and our front office team. No, it's all a team and we have a business team and we have a clinical team. Just there's little things we do in dentistry that kind of set people up for who they are. And I feel like if, if we start to kind of change that, change that view, it's going to change how we do things. I'm going to ask you more specifics. Um, okay. What percent of dental offs do you think have a morning huddle and do you recommend a morning huddle? Uh, okay. Um, what, let's change that into three. What percentage have a morning huddle? 30%. What percentage actually have an effective <laughs> morning huddle? two percent and do i recommend them 100 percent? i think it is absolutely the best way to start your day the entire team should be on board and it's the best way to communicate first thing in the morning and oh by the way team huddle should never be more than 10 12 minutes okay so now you just walked into that door All right. so what's the difference saying uh morning huddle that's not morning huddle that's not effective okay versus an effective morning huddle? i'll give you a great example as a team i was just talking to yesterday um they have an assistant that comes in at 6.15 in the morning and she works for an hour and a half before the morning huddle to gather information on every single patient on the schedule. Like she writes, she writes them on sticky notes for every single patient on the schedule. And then during the morning huddle, they go through every single patient and everything she's written down. That doesn't sound effective or efficient to me. Because the hygienists are over here like, why do I have to listen to the 12 people that you have on your schedule? Why, why do I need to know that back in 1989 you did a three-surface MOD or an MOD composite? on? Why are we doing that? It's not effective at all. Another thing that's not effective is when the doctor comes in halfway through the morning huddle and is brushing their teeth or eating their um, breakfast while everybody else was there on time and actually participating in the meeting. So what's an efficient one? How, how was yesterday? What worked? What didn't work? How does today look? What will work? What won't? Where do you want an emergency patient in the morning? Where do you want one in the afternoon? And now let's talk about any patients who are on the schedule who maybe they have a balance and we need to make sure that they stop and we collect. Maybe they have an appointment with doctor, but they don't have a hygiene appointment. Maybe they have a hygiene appointment, but they don't have one with the doctor, right? Those are the kind of things we want to hit on. Not what did we do back in five years ago on this tooth. That's a completely different meeting you have with your assistant prior to walking through into the operatory. You know, when you say emergency patient, um, that I, I want you to talk about that because the, the one thing that blows them out of emergency patients is the dentist always loves Mrs. Wimpleton, who comes in every three months for 10 years. She brushes and flosses every morning. And I, she's never given them a dime for anything. Right. And then Piglet call, walks in with an emergency <laughs> and is going to need, you know, root canal, bellum, crown, extractions, bridges, the whole nine yards. Right. And the dentist has this massive negative attitude because you're you're a pig you don't have an appointment you just walk right. in here and i'm looking at within my mba hat on and says you've never made a dime off as mrs jones right you should dismiss her as a patient and these pigs which is my entire family reunion 
are going to drop 5,000 bucks on an emergency, you know, $2,500 for an emergency toothache, root canal, bone crown. And, and whenever you say, well, here's an emergency and they don't have an appointment, we're going to squeeze them in. And the doctor already is steaming, doesn't like the, uh, the, the patient. Um, what, 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 are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and, 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 and more specifically, what do you do with emergencies? Okay, so first of all, we have to qualify what is an emergency. Because there's an appointment of convenience for somebody who's never been seen. And then there's a true emergency. An emergency is in pain, bleeding, swelling, something broke, they had an accident. That's an emergency. They're taking an over-the-counter pain med and it's not helping them. That's an emergency. Somebody who has had a toothache for three weeks or busted a tooth doing something four months ago and now wants to get it fixed, that's not an emergency. That is a patient we need to get in, have a comprehensive oral eval, take some intraoral photos, which are our best patient education system, right? We need to convert that patient to a actual patient and then we perform services on them. So what I find happening is front office, our business team, they answer the phone, patients in emergency, they say they're an emergency, they've never been in before and we just shove them in somewhere. It's not effective. It's not efficient. It affects not only that patient, it affects everybody else on the schedule. It affects the team. It affects the doctor. Doctor's upset. You have chaos for the rest of the day. So I think, first of all, you have to qualify what is, what is an emergency patient. Second, I love having the conversations with the doctors about the patients that they refuse to let go. You know, um, I love it when people ask me, do you charge for a missed appointment? Absolutely, I do. Oh, well, what if they leave? Um, they're not showing up for their appointments. <laughs> okay, they leave the practice. That's one less person we put on the schedule and now we have an open appointment that just lost us money. So it, that mindset cracks me up a little bit. You know, we can't let our patients go. Well, they don't pay. They show up late and um, or they don't show up at all. And oh, by the way, they don't accept your treatment. So why do we want them? Here, here's a question that um, I, I, I see both sides of this. Um, I, I, I hear uh, I've met, you know, a dozen assistants over the 25 years at a convention that literally starts crying because the doctor is a very aggressive person and will, will take emergency through lunch. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, she got there at seven and she leaves at seven and she didn't get to sit down or eat. And right. they, they cry real tears. There's there's other people <laughs> and, there, and there's other people that it's the other side of it that sometimes you need to work through your lunch. The dentist is just so damn lazy. He's not going to miss lunch and he's leaving at five o'clock. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts are about throwing an emergency over the lunch hour or attacking one on at the end of the day? I have a hard time. I have a hard time with somebody else making a decision. I can't eat. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I, th I think that we need to give people a mental and a physical break from an eight or nine hour day. Um, I have a hard time with that. And especially when somebody else makes that decision for myself or the doctor. Oh, they called. They really need to be seen. So, you know, I'm, you're not going to take a lunch today. You're going to stay and see these people. Meanwhile, I, I'm going to go ahead and go out. I, I, have, I have some problems with that. I think there's, a, again, a more effective way to fill our, our schedule. Block scheduling, deciding in the morning where those kind of people go. And, and then having amazing verbal skills. So that emergency patient calls, we've already used our two emergency places for that day. We've qualified that in fact, it is an emergency patient, but they've had the toothache for a couple of days. So we say, uh, you know, Miss Patient, I'm so sorry you're, you're having this issue. Uh, unfortunately today, we've squeezed a couple of emergency patients in. I know that I can see you at eight o'clock first thing in the morning across from a large appointment. I need you to be here 15 minutes early so we can get the paperwork done. And I literally have you in the chair when doc is ready so that we can see you. Most most likely we're going to want to put you on some antibiotics. Do you have anything you can't take? And go ahead and take that over-the-counter pain med tonight if it's working for you. We're going to get you taken care of tomorrow. So we have to we have to ensure that our team, number one, feels confident with what they're doing because the dentist, the leader, has allowed them to. And that they have amazing verbal skills so that the patient doesn't feel slighted or automatically hangs up the phone and starts calling somebody who will see him. And, and, you know, it goes back to that, too, and you, and you know this as well. Those patients that call 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they're not emergencies. They're looking for something, you know? So we have to educate our team members 
that's probably not an emergency patient. If they call, if they've had, if they woke up this morning with a toothache, they're not going to call us at three or four o'clock in the afternoon. They're going to call us at eight o'clock in the morning. Right. So identifying well, and that. And Phoenix, the reason, the true reason they call at three or four o'clock in the afternoon with the toothache is because that guy that was supposed to meet him to sell him the Oxycontin <laughs> didn't show up <laughs> and he's not returning any phone calls. He's they just like, got off the golf course. Because where's it's my Oxycontin here. boy? They're still, but your, your state's got a lot of uh, substance abuse too it in New does. Mexico. It I does. was reading that new, that uh, Phoenix and um, <laughs> that New Mexico. Um, in fact, I saw, I read one study in New Mexico had, one of the highest percentage of heroin uses in the United States. I saw that as well. It's a little, you know, and it's sad because I, I really feel like we don't have to do a, a history lesson, but it's kind of, New Mexico is kind of a lost state. Like people forget that it's there. And in the entire state, I mean, it's one of the largest landmass states in the United States. In the entire state, we have barely 2 million people in the entire state. So the, the crime issues and the drug issues we have, they're a little sad. So I'm going to throw just a general question. I'm just I'm just throwing questions that I see people whining about on Dental Town. Okay. Um, there's just a lot of moaning about overhead, and some blame it on you know uh, too many PPOs. Some blame it on they're paying too high for dental supplies. If, if some dentist called you up and said, you know, my my overheads, you know, seventy percent. What 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 are? I would say what, ouch. What, well, the the app the the American Dental Association has the best statistics that they have a PhD uh, economist who's just amazing, and he's showing sixty five point five for the average. So wow. so the one hundred fifty thousand dentists have a two thirds overhead, sixty five percent. You know, though, I want to know exactly what they're what they're including in the overhead because I think that's part of the problem too is because we don't understand business um, we're not sure what to put into the our overhead and and I'll say Bonnie you know, Bonnie is our numbers girl. Bonnie comes from that corporate background. She's brilliant. I'm like I'm fun now, to do be you around. Guys She's work, brilliant. Do you guys um <laughs> do you guys work on the same client together? Do you have separate clients? Uh, the majority, we eighty percent of our clients we do together because we're eighty percent. Yeah, we're we're a great team. Um Ryan, um, we're 35 minutes into this. Do you think we could um, someday, I mean, in the next week or whatever, have Bonnie Skype in? Absolutely. And this, this will be one show? Heck yeah. And that's Bonnie? Bonnie Pugh, P-U-G-H. P-U-G-H. Mm-hmm. And if the H is silent, she'd be a pug dog? She would pug? indeed. But she's Bonnie too pug? cute. She's too cute to be Bonnie Pugh. Bonnie Pugh uh-huh. in Baltimore, Maryland. That is correct. And... Um, where the first dental school in the United States was? Oh, she knows all about and, it. And and the Absolutely. dental and the dental museum. Yeah. But 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 back to specifically, if some dentist is calling you and saying, you know, my my overhead's too high. Right. So we we actually have a P and L that that she created, you know, specifically for dentistry, and it, it's like four pages. It's crazy, but we give that to our clients in the very beginning if they really want to know what their overhead is and what the, where they should be with production and collection and 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 how we're going to increase their growth then we have to find out that information so that is definitely one thing we research from day one i'll just i'll give you an example real quick this was kind of cool we've been working with one dentist for three years um three and a half years she was the very first one that came out with practice dynamics and we're almost more of a life coach for her now but the beginning of a couple of years ago she came to us and she said okay i don't want to do a bonus system i don't want to do this she goes here's what i want to do i want to take you two and the entire team to disney world at the end of this year as and i want you guys to give us a retreat so it's going to be four days um maybe you guys just put the whole thing together but i want the entire thing paid for before we even go airfare food everything i want it all paid for before we go and so we have to dig deep into okay what are her expenses what is this going to cost what does our overhead look like and then we had to set all of the goals for the next nine months so that we could pay for a trip and you know of course we did it and it was amazing and it was so much fun we got to you know we had team meetings in the morning and then set everybody off to do their um their fun at disney world in the afternoon but that that is that's again that's the business side of dentistry coming into all of this what are, what are your numbers what are what is your overhead if it's too high we have to look at that where is it too high is your supply system ineffective um is do you have too many team members are you overpaying people you know i mean we have to you have to look at that it's part of business uh, business um a lot of these um okay so a lot of these kids are coming out of school and they're freaked out because they're three, four hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Mm-hmm. 
um, which I tell them is will cost, which is about one tenth of their first divorce. And, um, you know, so I tell them, you know, that that's nothing, but a lot, but they're stressed or they're, they're listening to you now. And the me, the dental, um, world is, is convincing them that, well, if you want to be a good dentist, you got to, you're 350,000 debt now, but you got to buy another $150,000 CAD CAM machine, a mm. hundred thousand dollar CBCT, a $75,000 laser. Right. And I just want to know in your, forget the last 27 years, cause a lot of this stuff didn't even exist back then, but yeah. I, I would say like in the last five years, would you say that if you want to have a million dollar practice and take home $300,000 a year that you need a CAD cam, a CBCT and a laser, or do you just not see that? Oh no, we, uh, all of our clients have a technology budget as well as a marketing budget. And we just tell them this is a part of your life now, because if you think about it, dentist IQ go up in the, in the American's eyes, depending on the technology that they have in their practice. Like you can be the worst dentist. They don't know if you're a good dentist or not. They see the team, they see the office decor, they see uh, the technology in there. You gotta be good. You gotta know what you're doing, right? So that that's even before they've, they've opened their mouth to say ah to you. And so absolutely, I think you have to have, you know, three to 5% um, technology budget. Same thing with your marketing. And we just have to know marketing is part of our life now. We got to get over this selling our dentistry, whatever. It's a business. Marketing is part of your life now. And, um, okay. So then, so then, um, another uh, general question, um, a lot of dentists sit there and they think, you know, all my problems would be solved if I just had 10 more new patients a month. They, right. They think, do you, do you think, um, more new patients is a silver bullet that fixes a lot of problems? No. And I love that you brought this up because because here's what I like to do when they're like new patients, new patients, new patients. We need new patients. I'll run a report. I'm like, let's look at how many active patients you have. And then we have to have the discussion. What is an active patient? You know, I'm not saying what the software says. I'm saying what doctor in your eyes is an active patient. I'm always amazed when they say, well, as long as I've seen them in the last 18 months, really that's active. Like if they're on active recall and they have all their work, that's, that's active, right? If they're three months behind on their recall, they're not active. They're behind. So anyway, I got to run that report. Okay, so you had five new patients last month. How many of them walked through the door again? Retention. I, I think it's a, more about retention than it is new. Because we have a gold mine in our software. We have a gold mine in continuing care. We have a gold mine in the patients that are sitting there that we completely forgot about because we're focusing on getting the new patient in. Okay, I ran a report in a, a dental office in Atlanta. They had $1.5 million in diagnosed unscheduled treatment in the last nine months. 1.5 million. Part of that says to you me. You can get married and divorced together with that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> Part of that says to me they're they're giving options. You know, like maybe the, the patient's missing a tooth and they gave the option of an implant or a bridge. And the patient says, I'll do the implant. And they just didn't, you know, reject the bridge or the, yeah, the bridge so it doesn't come up anymore. But part of that is that's what we do. We're so focused on getting the new patient in that we forget about our existing patients. And that goes with conti our continuing care, our hygiene department as well. I found in one office, they had 500 patients that were past due. So that we're doing the last six months and didn't have an appointment. They had 150 patients that were due basically right now that were due for hygiene and didn't have an appointment. And then they had another 300 patients that were due in the next six months that didn't have an appointment. That's a gold mine. Like that's crazy. And so we're talking about putting somebody out on the corner with a sign and twirling it and, you know, twerking and making it look awesome so that we can get somebody new in the door. But I've got 800 patients that have already met you, have already been through your door, know where you are, that we just simply don't have an appointment for. And and the people that have been in your office, that's the most likely person on to the return. planet Earth to ever get back. Not some Absolutely. kid in Zimbabwe right. or the Congo. Right. Yeah. So um we, we we've seen all I mean, when you and I uh you know, twenty seven years ago, I mean marketing was a yellow page ad. Oh yeah. Um or you just didn't you didn't. Yeah. Because so, you couldn't. You weren't supposed to do that. 
Yeah, when I actually took out a full page ad when I got here, and I got a free dinner from the executive director of the Arizona State <laughs> Dental Association <laughs> with about five complaints telling me that um, yeah. would you go if you had prostate cancer? Would you pick a oncologist out of the yellow pages? If you had a heart attack, would you pick it? And I was like, wow! But I got a free lunch out of it. Well, there you go. And um, and then you said, "Hi, I'm Howard. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be meeting again." <laughs> oh my God. And now I'm that old guy down there. That's funny how uh, things change. Um, what What's hot and what's not in marketing? Is there anything mm. that you think that's more effective or Great less effective? Question. Well, I'm a huge social media buff. I love social media. I think uh, 100% it's about the relationship. And I, and I really truly believe now more than ever, people want relationships. You know, it used to be no big deal. You go into the doctor, you have done whatever you need to have done. You go to the dentist and, and you, whatever. You don't have that personal bonding, that relationship. People want relationships now. It's really funny how this whole social media has completely turned the way we are now. Really. And you know who the first social media and dentistry was? Oh, I think I might. Oh my God. Facebook was 2004. Dental Town was 1998. And I, I saw that. I, I'd always ask these dentists. Um, there was, there was a, a brand new lab back in the day and it was Sean Keating. And he'd always be posting, he'd always be talking to the dentist on Dental Town. They'd post a case and he's like, oh my God, you, you're posting a picture of, of an impression and you still got the bloody cotton roll in. He goes, dude, I'm the lab man on the other end. I don't want to see your damn blood. You know, if you're that crazy and the fact that he would get on there and be honest and mixing up and the next thing you know, thousands of dentists are in the case and I meet these dentists and it's the same thing. They'd say, yeah. I would rather do business with a human I know on dental town. It's true. And, and, and then that, then Dan Fisher of Ultradent starts posting and, and these guys say, well, if I buy from, uh, this company, I, I don't know who the owner is. I, I couldn't pick the owner out of a uh, with out of a police lineup. And you're right. I see it with dentists. Dentists buy from dental companies where they put a face behind the company. And you're saying patients want well, the same thing. Well, guess what? Our patients stalk us. I promise you. If they're even thinking about you, they go to the website. They make sure the picture. They go to meet the doctor, meet the team first. They don't care what you what kind of services you're providing. They go and they meet the people. Then they go to Facebook to see if you're funny, if you've got good posts, or if it's all educational. And I guarantee you, when patients walk in now, they know every person on the business team because they've already stalked us. Yeah, I've um the uh, my IT guys say that on dental websites. Uh, Obviously, the first page is, you know, the landing page, mm -hmm. but the most likely thing they're going to collect is go to is the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know who gets it? Orthodontist get it. I love being around orthodontist. They just get marketing. They, they kind of get business. And, the, and they just get marketing because they are crazy out there. Some of the best campaigns that I'll recommend, I got from an orthodontist somewhere. Like I'm, I'm friends and follow. Okay, so you just you just walked into a, a big quandary of mine. Cause, oh so we have Dental Town, Ortho Town, and the surveys on um, Ortho Town show that about 95% of the orthodontists use a treatment plan coordinator to mm -hmm. present the treatment and fees. Mm -hmm. And then the general dentist, that would be about 5%. Mm -hmm. So why are the orthodontists use, using them 95% of the time and the general dentist using them 5% I'm, of the I'm time? telling you, they get it. They do. It's funny. I just took my 13-year-old son to an orthodontist in small town America, you know, Aztec. Uh, his overhead's got to be crazy. I mean, I bet you he has 25 ladies in there working for him. And they're, but we walked through the door. We got, we had Megan. She was the first one. She gave us a tour of the office. Little gal came and took his x-rays. Megan took us back to the consultation room. We were in there the rest of the entire time. Doctor came in, met me, showed a couple of pictures, talked to Mikey. He left back with Megan again. But now I know Megan. <laughs> You know, if I have a question, I call Megan. Um, I, I just feel like they they get it. They trust. Why do they get I'm it so much? I'm not sure. They they do get it. They they do I, get the yeah. business. They do get it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm in Ahwatukee here, and which is in southern Phoenix. It's part of Phoenix, and uh, there's two Canadian orthodontists, and and where where do they set up? Oh, right across from the high school. You can sure. see them. You can see them from the front door sure. of the high school. You go in their lobbies and you get an ice cream cone and video games and they're just crushing. It. I, I tell you, I spoke at um, CareStreams National Ortho 
convention two years ago. I did social media for them. I was in the ballroom and I loved it because I knew every office, like I knew that they were an office, not because necessarily they were sitting together, but every single ortho team there had on a T like their structured t-shirt every day and they were different colors but on the front they had the doctor's name then they had their name and then they all had their logo or their tagline on the back so i'm looking out at the social media audience and there's a hundred different offices in the room and i know that there's a hundred because they're all these little pods and they're and they're all wearing their t-shirts and they have their taglines on the back i mean it was awesome one office was my favorite i actually had them stand up and because I, I told them i said man you guys get marketing you get this um i said but this one's my favorite the doctor's name was dr shift like his name was shift and so on back of all their shirts, it said shift happens. I'm like, that is brilliant. Yeah. Like, it's brilliant. <laughs> and then this little blonde, she's like, do you get it? We're ortho shift. That's his name. Do you get it? And I'm like, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, I mean, look, just that stat alone, that 95% of orthodontists use yeah. um, a treatment plan coordinator, only 5% of us do. I mean, I mean, they just, and then you look at their national incomes. I mean, the average orthodontist is doubling a general dentist. I mean, every dentist here should probably just go have lunch with their orthodontist and say, "Absolutely, uh, how can how can I get business too?" So um, we're uh, at the end of the hour. So we'll we'll do Bonnie uh, another uh, hour, but Brian, we'll we'll do them back to back because our brand is an hour and they they're used to an hour deal. Um, but uh, I'm going to go into overtime with you. Um, um, since we're seniors now, since we're uh, been a quarter of a century, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sorry, what? Well, we, well, when <laughs> the fact that we've been in this business over twenty five years, and right. they're coming out of dental school at twenty five. Wow, we're kind of their seniors. Dang. Um, a, an over proportion of the show is dentists under thirty. What advice would you give the kids? Um, I I would say don't think you can't afford it, and don't think that you can't can afford what help. Oh, I know. I know. They paid three hundred fifty thousand dollars for dental school, but they won't pay. What, what, what is your low fee? What is your starter fee? Remote. Eight? I, I can help somebody remotely log in and help them re for eight ninety five a month. You know, I mean, that's nothing. Really, it's, it's not even a crown. It's a crown. It's exactly. less. It's a PPO crown. Yeah, I need to raise which my takes some four <laughs> minutes to prop. Um, what would I tell them? That, I would, that should be your tagline for a four minute PPO prep crown. <laughs> I can you could have you. me for a month right on the phone email. That's right. Um, I would tell them to can, don't stop educating themselves just because you got out of dental school. Don't stop. Like it, just keep learning keep every it changes so much howard think about i mean we keep saying 25 years 27 years oh my gosh we've been doing this for a long time but think of how much it's changed i mean you know when i was chairside assisting in the first year or so we didn't wear gloves we didn't have a mask we weren't worried about all that stuff things have changed so much you know we had the the paper appointment book and the the traditional film x-rays and the pegboard ledger and and it's changed so like don't Pin, pigeonhole yourself. I would say on one hand, don't think you can do everything, but on the other hand, don't ever stop. You know, when I got out of school, I got to tell you these young kids an old story. When we got out of school, um, I got out of school in 87, then it was uh, 89 where uh, the AIDS kind of came out of mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, it was in uh, Los Angeles to uh, two young men were in there with Capsi sarcoma and so, and which you shouldn't have unless you're like 80. And these guys were in their, you know, twenties and they were both gay mm -hmm. and a very smart epidemiologist thought, okay, that's just, these are just two very rare events. But back at that time, when I opened up, um, people were coming in and saying, uh, they were all afraid they were going to get AIDS from my handpiece. Yeah. And they, 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 they come in. I mean, every, every third patient is like, well, do you sterilize? You know what I used to say? They'd say, um, do you sterilize your drills? And I'd say, well, sure. Why, why do you ask? Well, I, I, I'm concerned. Of, I said, what are you concerned about? AIDS? And I said, well, AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease, and I have you scheduled for a crown. <laughs> On and your, then, and then, and then what I do, <laughs> th th then, what, then what I do, I would pull, I'd open my drawer in the optory and I pull out a condom. I said, my policy is if you put the condom on me, I'll wear it while I'm working on your tooth. 
And, oh, and then I would hand it God. to the, 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 the grandmas, and they couldn't even touch it. They, they'd put up their hand, and it'd fall in their lap, and they'd flick it off like it was a cockroach or something. And I'd say, I'd say, Margaret, if your husband came home with gonorrhea, <laughs> and he said he caught it at Dr. Fran's office when he was doing a filling. Right. Would you would you believe that? Because if you believe that, I want to marry you right now. I, I think we can do some sort of social media campaign with that, Howard. Oh my god! Yeah. So 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 what you're saying is time change. And I and I just want to say one thing. Here's my close: is um, the dentists who make the most money don't even do dentistry. Like Rick Kirsch, like um, Rick Workman is the only dentist I know who's a billionaire mm-hmm. from dentistry, and he owns you know 1,500 offices. He owns Harlan Dental Care. He has his own jet, and um, he hasn't touched a patient in 20 years. Uh, Rick Kirshner has 350 comfort dental offices. He hadn't seen a patient in 20 years. Steve Thorne, Pacific Dental Care, his dad's a dentist, and he thought, why should I go to school eight years? In eight years, I could own 10 offices. Mm-hmm. And now he owns 500 offices, and he has three jets. And I'm not saying that your goal is not to do dentistry and own a jet and all that, because I'm like you. I, I love doing dentistry. And, and my, my ideal patient, my favorite patient is someone who comes in who's literally holding their face in tears and scared and in pain. I, that That's mine. Sure. Some dentists like the cosmetic makeover. Right. Um, the, um, the dentists who are like on drugs. Uh, like pediatric uh, dentist, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, everybody likes their different things. Some right. like kids, some like implants, some like cosmetics. I like pain chair. I mean, God, when I was in dental school, if I ever had an opening, I ran right to the third floor and Susan Wires, who uh, uh, was the oral surgery instructor, and uh, she was just so damn cool. Uh, she passed a few years ago and uh, just... Getting him out of pain, calming down. You know, I get that. But the point is, if you don't do the business side, right. you, you can't even enjoy what you're doing. Absolutely. And when you crush the business side, like right now, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i 53, but ever since I was like 30, the money side was so taken care of, I can just play in my dental office. If I, if I go to the convention, uh, a laser, I mean, you could need it. You could say laser stands for light amplification, stimulation, emission, or radiation. You could say it stands for losing all savings equals reality. <laughs> but if you're rich, it doesn't matter. Because I look at some of these toys as, well, I could go buy a Porsche for a hundred grand. Right. So why can't I buy a BioLace? If, if you'd rather have a BioLace than a Porsche, knock yourself out. But it's girls, it's consultants like Lacey that can get you there. And it's my my belief that uh, it's the stress from finances is a third of the divorce. They say divorces come in th- uh, thirds. Third over money, third over sex, and a third over substance abuse. And when I look at dentists, 18% of dentists will go to inpatient rehab while in their careers. So that's one in five. And it's very tied to the finance, the money. And let Lacey make you get rich over the next three to five years. And then you won't want to drink. You won't be stressed out. And then when you go see her speak at the Hinman for the ninth time in a row and you see some fancy toy, whatever it is, you can just buy in cash because you, you, you want it. You want to play. But um, thanks for keeping it real for 27 years. Thanks for speaking uh, up here at the local Arizona State Dental Association. Congratulations on nine times of him and some of the biggest names in dentistry. I've never done that. And um, and uh, my friend uh, in Arizona, uh, Craig Steichen, all those guys, they love you. Oh, how nice. So uh, thanks okay. a lot for coming Thank over you. to the house. Appreciate Thank it. you very much. And what can my homies find on your website, practicedynamics.net? You know what? I'm super .net. I'm super excited about the website. We just could, did a complete and total overhaul on it. So I'm super excited about the website. Um, I, I think that you can find a lot of information. I hope that it describes what we do and how we help our clients. We've just added um, Ask an Expert. So you can actually go on the website and type in your questions and then we we can answer them for you if you're not ready to have an actual conversation with us. We have blogs on there. We have all kinds of information about my speaking, but also about our consulting, how we help teams. Right on. Yeah. Well, and of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm uh, I love Facebook. I'm what, what's, your, uh, what's your what's uh, your on Facebook? It's page. Practice Dynamics. It's Facebook.com slash Practice Dynamics Group. Practice Dynamics Group is on. And what's Facebook. your Twitter? Is at Practice Dynamic. Okay. Well, seriously, it's an honor that you came by today. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Ryan.